Welcome to Scary Stories NYC. I'm your old pal, Bigfoot. Today is the first sunny day we've had in some time around here, so I've decided to stay inside and wait for the weather to become inclement again. There's usually not much business for us mythical monster-type creatures when it's sunny out. Of course, there are some exceptions to that rule, such as this story we're about to tell you. We think it's just as scary as a tale taking place at 3 a.m., even though we call this one Dogman in the Broad Daylight. Dear Scary Stories NYC, This story happened last year when I was dating this crazy European model we can call Inga. She was driving me from New York City to somewhere in Pennsylvania, and she kept getting lost due to her old, outdated GPS system. My phone had better GPS on it, and once she figured that out, she became very demanding and forced me to shout out directions to her. At some point, her engine overheated on this highway in Pennsylvania somewhere, and she pulled off the highway onto the side of the road by some trees. Soon she was shouting stuff at some operator on some speakerphone somewhere and apparently someone was dispatched to come fix whatever had happened to her vehicle. Since I'm a lifelong New Yorker, I don't know how to drive and wouldn't be able to tell you what was wrong with her chariot. All I remember was that she thought it was my fault somehow. I hadn't given her the directions clearly enough so that had caused her car to overheat. Something like that, close enough. She was lecturing me partially in English and partially in European, and I was zoning out watching the leaves on the trees blowing in the wind. Then, I noticed a number of them moving in unison, as though they had been pushed by something large. There's a man in there, I said, and Inga went on yammering nonstop. There's a man in those woods, I said, trying to put more alarm in my voice this time. There's a very tall man. I cut short what I was saying and stared as the very tall man emerged from behind the trees and revealed himself to be very, very tall indeed. On the other hand, he also revealed himself to be something very other than a man. Oh, this guy stood up on his hind legs like a human, but the resemblance ended there. I must have been staring at it for 30 seconds or longer, and it stared right back at me that entire time. Inga never stopped fussing and swearing. I hadn't been listening to her when she got in my face, angrily shouting at me and asking, have you been listening to a single word I've been saying? I moved her head out of my way so that I could return to staring at the very tall, hairy man. It had fur, but extremely long fur, like those expensive dogs you see the rich people walking around sometimes in Central Park. It was a bright, reddish-yellow colored fur, and quite striking. You could see that it stood bipedally, but it was difficult to make out the exact body shape due to the large amount of long, wavy fur. It was almost as though he wore clothing, the way the hair and its constant movement around him altered his body shape to whatever it seemed to want it to be. The one unmistakable part of the creature or man or whatever it was had to be the face or the head up on top. It was as though a golden retriever had gone bad. I mean to say, imagine a golden retriever dog, an orange dog, very large, long, luxuriant fur. Now, imagine it larger. Imagine it maxed out in every way, and imagine the kind expression of a golden retriever replaced 
with the hateful glare of an unrepentant serial killer. Inga, finally seeing what I was seeing, began screaming like a complete lunatic. I mean, she was freaking out. I was too, but she was flipping out loudly and all over the place. This agitated the dog, I would say, and it charged the car, for some reason choosing my passenger side window to slam its face directly against, bearing its fangs and gnawing at the glass. It barked and growled and emitted these pathetic squealing sounds. So desperate was it to get in at me in that car. Its eyes rolled back into its head and the dog-headed man-thing appeared to be in a complete frenzy. He was still behaving more rationally than Inga, but he was in a terrifying frenzy and I felt certain I was about to depart this mortal coil. This animal's teeth were literally as long as my entire head. I knew this was the end, and I cried in a gasping, shocked way. Inga leaned on the car horn, and the dog man ran over to her side of the car. I went to check to see if my car door was locked, and I accidentally opened it up. That entire time the dogman had been an inch from my face, that door between us had been unlocked. I saw spots around the sides of my vision, which was about to go black. I knew I was passing out from shock, but I knew I had to close my car door before I could lock it. I had to swing it open a bit more to gain momentum then slam it shut as hard as I could. I had to do it right away, while the monster was on the other side of the car. I took a deep breath and opened the door, then slammed it shut. I wasn't sure if I had done it hard enough, but when I pressed the lock button, it sounded like the door had been locked. At that point, consciousness began to blacken out for me, and I passed out of this world for a while. When I woke up, Inga was screaming in three languages at the car repair service, or whoever she had called. The dogman didn't seem to be there, but Inga hadn't calmed down any. I wondered how long I had been out, but I knew better than to ask her. I looked down at my hands, and there, between my legs on the seat, was my cell phone. The entire time the creature was right next to me, I hadn't thought to try to snap off even one single shot. I hadn't tried to get a photo of the thing, not even to leave some evidence about what had done me in, if I had failed to survive the encounter. I looked around the woods, wondering if the creature was still nearby, wondering if I might get another chance to take a photo of it. I knew it might still be checking us out, but... It would be more likely from a safer distance now that help had arrived. I knew I had blown my chance. I've had a recurring dream since that day. I dream that I'm with that crazy shouting European model and she's driving too fast and not listening to my directions. Her fancy car overheats. Then we pull over onto Dogman's front lawn. He comes out to say hi in his inimitable manner, and I'm ready, armed with my cell phone in hand. I take clear, well-lit, full frontal shots of the creature as it charges the car. I take perfect, bright, full-color photos of the dogman's angry face, its exposed fangs its bloodshot, insane eyes. I get photos of the insides of a dogman's mouth so detailed they probably contain DNA in them. And then, as we're driving to the TV station to be interviewed by George Knapp about my incredible, unprecedented dogman photos, that's when I wake up.
Then I return to the real world where I don't possess the instincts of a photojournalist, where I don't think ahead, where I panicked and acted like a coward. This reality, where instead of presenting my story to the nation on coast to coast, I'm emailing it in to Scary Stories NYC instead. No offense. They say it's better to regret something you have done than to regret something you haven't. And I know this to be true. Why did I not take photos of the dog man? Even if they came out as blurry as blob squatches, at least I might have had some proof of my story. And maybe one or more of them might have come out clear and in focus. Think of how the world might have been changed if only in that moment I hadn't thought of myself and I had thought of the future. If I had thought of others or thought of science instead of thinking of my own safety or panicking, the entire world might be really different today. Each one of us is given a chance to affect great change in our lives. Some of us are handed these opportunities over and over, while others of us only get one single chance. Alongside the highway, on a brightly lit, extra clear day, when all the fates conspire to give us the perfect chance to get a clear picture of... Dogman. In the broad daylight... Don't go anywhere, we've got another Dogman story for you now. This one doesn't take place during the daytime, but it does happen in a place we usually associate with fun. The county fair. But what happens when young newlyweds wander into the newly weeds just outside the fairgrounds might be described as a bit unfair. In this all-new story we call... Dogman at the County Fairgrounds. Dear Scary Stories NYC, This is a story that happened to me and my wife in the first year of our marriage. It's a story she's forbidden me to tell for years, citing concern that we'd get sued for smearing or slandering someone's business after I proved to her that the fair this happened at has been closed down for years, she relented. I'm still not supposed to tell you exactly where it took place, but I'll try to describe everything in as much detail as I can so that you can get as clear a picture of what happened as possible. Once upon a time, there was a traveling fair that would hit our area in the late summer and early autumn. This was when my wife, who we can call Martha and I, lived in the country. Well, it was the edge of the suburbs, but it felt like the country to the two of us, since we had each grown up in two different, fairly large, eastern cities. I think our first home together being located so far from a metropolitan area added to our mutual patience for each other. We were both going through so many experiences for the first time, both together and separately. It melded us into a team early on, and we've mainly stayed in that kind of headspace for the entirety of our marriage, at least so far. Knock on wood. That would be all I would need to suddenly have marriage drama after so long a time. At any rate, we've long since moved back to the city, but... I'm glad our first home was out by the spooky old forest. When we first moved to that place, the old man who had built it himself was there to show us around. He kind of made it clear he intended to check up on the place and make sure we were taking care of it well, which creeped my wife out. She doesn't like being spied on even to this day. She has tape over her computer's camera and she won't even join most social media. So... She really didn't like the idea of the former owner showing up at random times to pass judgment on her housekeeping abilities, especially since she and I were both driving to different towns to work full-time jobs in that era. The house was centrally located, but we knew that eventually we'd have to get employment in the same town and move again 
to a more permanent home. This place was temporary lodging to us, and we didn't want to be lectured about it. Nevertheless, the former owner wasn't such a bad guy, and he seemed to mean well. He never really criticized us, and he did offer to help out. He would warn us both about the old man of the mountain. That's what he called him. We would both ask him what he meant by that. Who is the old man of the mountain? He would just turn and stare at us with these crazy and intense eyes. I felt like he thought we were crazy or that our question was crazy. His stare made me feel guilty as though he were saying that I already knew the answer to the question I was asking. I really didn't though. There was another neighbor who spoke to us one time about the former owner. She told us he believed in Bigfoot, so we all figured that the old man of the mountain must have been his way to refer to Bigfoot. We asked the neighbor if she believed in Sasquatch and she laughed, but then just kind of stared off for a while. I noticed she never answered the question with a yes or a no. I don't suppose it matters either way, though, since this isn't a story about Bigfoot. This is a story about the Dog Man. So, the fair came through town and we were both very excited. It was within walking distance and it felt like, instead of us having to drive hours in each direction to get somewhere, finally the world was driving a long distance to hang out near us. It felt very special. That was before we went. We would live there another three years, but never attend the fair ever again. And I'll tell you exactly why. Martha and I went on the Ferris wheel. We went on all the rides. They had everything except a full-scale roller coaster, and we went on some of the rides twice. After hours of laughter, it was getting dark, and we were getting frisky. We wandered off behind some tents toward the forest so that we could spend a little time together enjoying each other's company before walking home. It had been such a perfect night and we were both very happy. Martha leaned against a tree and I leaned against Martha. We were extremely into each other in that moment when a loud snapping or a cracking noise to my left and to Martha's right grabbed both of our attention at once. It was a demonic, nightmare-type vision standing there greeting us. It was a monster emerging from those woods, literally a monster out of a story or a movie. Not a bear, not a rabid dog, not even a Bigfoot. This was something that looked like it cost a lot of CGI money to create. It was a chimera, like something from an ancient statue. It had the head of a dog or a wolf or a jackal, but it had the body of a beast man. It was an impossible creature, something you could dream, but you could never see in reality. And the most inconvenient part about this all was that the impossible creature seemed to, impossibly, be seeing us as clearly as we were seeing it. The dog man shifted quickly into some sort of lowered down, angry looking attack mode. It looked like it was ready to defend should we attack. I was pretty sure I didn't want to attack, but I looked for Martha to see what she wanted to do. I couldn't find her at first. Then I realized that was because Martha had already run away from there. I followed her, and unfortunately for both of us, the dogman followed me. This thing's arms were so long that I could see them at points over my head as it reached out to grab me while we ran. I remember slipping on mud and falling face first into it. We were right behind the tents at that point, and I couldn't see my wife or anyone else there. I flopped around on my back and looked up at the dog man, who was himself slipping on that incredibly wet, muddy patch of dirt. 
Seizing my opportunity, I got up on all fours and began scrambling away from the monster, trying to hug the back of the tent there, hoping I could eventually find the entrance to the tent and escape the monster that way. Not every story ends like in the movies, though. Sometimes we don't get away from the monster. Sometimes we fall face first back into the mud. And on those occasions, we accept our fate. We understand that our time has come due, and we experience gratitude at all the chances we had and all the joys we've experienced. We prepare to meet our Maker, and we recognize it may be time to go. And then, a big fat guy comes out with a high-pressure water hose and blasts the dogman away from you. I watched as the bored-looking middle-aged man watered the dogman down and heard it whimpering like a cocker spaniel as it ran off. Get up, said the man. Before I understood he was talking to me, he began blasting me with the same hose he had blasted the dogman with. He didn't just clean the mud off me, he launched most of it over into the next county. I tried to ask him questions, but he ignored me and walked away. Martha was so happy to see me safe, I soon forgot about the man. But I was safe. I was wet and freezing, but I was safe, and I walked home with Martha that night, knowing I would live to see the morning. But what did it say about the dogman that the fair had a contingency plan set up to ward him off? They were so used to him bothering patrons, they were bored of it. Something about all of that gave the fair an air of danger and evil that was more than even us city dwellers were quite used to. And I suppose that might explain why that was the first, last, and only time we encountered... The Dogman at the County Fairgrounds. He's cooler than Rudolph Valentino. He's our executive producer, Big Tino. I know I just rhymed Tino with Tino, but what are you gonna do? Please join me in thanking Big Tino 100 for his big Christmas contribution to this channel. He used our super thanks button located under each of our YouTube videos, and that's the reason we have a show tonight. I can guarantee that money will go toward necessities, Big Tino, because well, I just don't have money for luxuries any longer. But as long as we can keep me and the cats fed, maybe we can keep this channel alive too. So thanks to Big Tino for giving us a fighting chance. Happy holidays and new year to you, Big Tino. And now here to explain how you too can become an executive producer like Big Tino 100. We've got our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank. Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button. Or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 LaScary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.